Hello, hello. Welcome back to the channel. In this video, we are going to cover chapter four of the Salvadores structure in architecture textbook. So this book is about structural requirements. And you know that there are a few such as the basic requirements, then equilibrium, stability, strength, functionality, economy, aesthetics, and optimal structures. So let's take a look at all of them. So equilibrium, the fundamental requirement of equilibrium is concerned with the guarantee that a building or uh, any parts thereof will not move. So um, the static equilibrium versus dynamic equilibrium, actually, um, that is uh, that deals with objects in motion. So um, the principles governing the motion of bodies uh, were published by Isaac Newton in 1687. And you know that they are called Newton's laws. So uh, basically, the um, structures called statically determinate support loads by developing reaction forces uh, whose values do not depend on the material used. So these reaction forces can be determined by the two simple equations of linear and rotational equilibrium, stating that the numerical sum of all forces and all of the rotational actions must equal zero for static equilibrium to exist. So um, Newton's three laws of motion can be concisely stated as follows. The first one, inertia. So an object at rest will remain at rest or an object in motion will remain in motion unless acted on by an external force. The second one, force is directly proportional to the mass of a body multiplied by its acceleration. And the third one is equilibrium. Every force action has an equal and opposite reaction. So the sum of them equals zero. Um, so um, uh, there are essentially only two basic conditions of equilibrium, linear and rotational. So linear equilibrium states that for an object to stay at rest, a straight push or a pull on the object in any direction in space must be balanced by a net equal force in exactly the opposite direction. And um, rotational equilibrium refers to a similar balance of forces as well. So in this case, however, the force that causes an object to rotate about a point must be balanced by an equal and opposite rotational tendency. So uh, let's take a little closer look to the linear um, equilibrium. So you can see here uh, there is a free body diagram of an elevator. So how those cables actually work. So um, you can see that if um, there is an elevator hanging from a cable uh, and it's supported by the pull of the cables, uh, that uh, the cables in turn hang from the pulley at the top of the building. So if the elevator and its occupants weigh 2,000 pounds and is at rest, the cable exerts on the elevator a pull of 2,000 pounds. So the weight uh, or the downward force of gravity acting on an object, uh, that's the, um, the weight uh, of the elevator and the upward pull of the cable are equal. So they balance out. And then the elevator is in linear equilibrium. And you can see uh, there is a diagram. So 
uh, in uh, the simplified abstraction of this balance of forces, which uses vector arrows to the represent the forces, is referred to as a free body diagram or FBD. And that is one of the most essential conceptual tools in engineering mechanics. So please refer back to the textbook and just um, get familiar with this concept. Um, so um, also let's take a look at the rotational equilibrium. So that is an everyday experience and you know that. That is uh, that can be visualized by um, uh, the experience of a seesaw, uh, or um, for example, uh, when you look at that, uh, that uh, is the uh, the vertical equilibrium, and when the weights of the two children react with an upward push equal to their combined weight and that of the board. So, and the supporting force is therefore known as a reaction. So, and um, also tug of war is another example of that. So you all know how that works. So, um, uh, so long as the total force exerted is the same magnitude, but in opposite directions on each side, there will be a linear equilibrium, even if, uh, for example, the uh, children who play tug of war individually pull with different force magnitude. Um, another example is uh, the equilibrium of vertical forces. So you can see there is an ancient Greek statue here, how um, actually that works. And you can see another uh, rotational equilibrium example here. So also uh, there is um, principle of moment and you can see uh, people is uh, a person is opening a bottle, and uh, that is actually the moment, the principle of moment, known as a torque in physics, and that is the action of a force removed a distance from an object. So the result of its action relative to that point is to generate rotation. Its technical definition is force multiplied by perpendicular distance. So, um, and we uh, can see that in two ways. And one is balance. And the second one is force multiplication. So um, also what we need to remember here. So the application of the concept of equilibrium will be considered in the study of the second structural requirement, stability. And we are moving to that. So let's take a look at the stability. So the requirement of rigid body stability is concerned with the danger of unacceptable motions of the building as a whole. When a tall building is acted upon by a hurricane wind and is not properly anchored in the ground or balanced by its own weight, it may topple over without disintegrating. The building is unstable in rotation, and that is particularly true of tall, narrow buildings. So, um, for example, like a, if you look at the slim cardboard box resting on a, a rough surface, uh, that uh, actually will help to prevent it from sliding. And another uh, diagram here and a few images. So please definitely take a look at that. So, um, and there is a diagram that I would like to discuss and that is the instability due to wind. So the pressure of the wind, which actually increases with height, causes a resultant clockwise overturning moment uh, with respect to the front edge of the structure. So. For rotational stability, this moment must be balanced by at least as great over a resistant moment. 
the resistant moment may be due to the self weight of the structure, which with respect to the front edge of the structure creates a counterclockwise resistant moment. So, and you can see um, uh, that if you just place an empty serial box and simply blow on the long face of it. So how that is actually going to react when there is a net resultant wind pressure, you blow it on the box and then uh, how that react to that. So um, we can see a few examples of failure due to that. And there is another um, catastrophic example of foundation instability uh, that we can see in the apartment building in Niigata, Japan. So that was back in 1964 earthquake. And then um, we can see the ground um, phenomenon known as liquefaction in which the seismic motions cause groundwater to become pressurized and thereby turn solid soil into a mud. So the shaking did not substantially damage the building, but the ground beneath them simply gave way and the entire apartment block sank into it. So you can uh, Google it and uh, you can learn more about that if you are interested. So the equilibrium of a building on a slope is illustrated here as well. And you can see that the weight of the structure acting vertically is decomposed into two component vectors. So these are two sides of a right triangle whose um, hypotenuse is uh, proportional to the weight. And again, the linear tower of Pisa, it shows actually how they um, have stabilized that. So there were safety stabilizing cables and there was a drilling rig that actually uh, extracted the soil before tower foundation. And then that extracted soil caused high side of foundation to drop downward and actually that um, stabilized the whole tower. So, um, also, what else is important to remember here? So, um, and there are diagrams showing the instability due to sliding, and the picture showing that um, building failure in Niigata, Japan. So, also, there is a raft foundation, and uh, let's take a look at um actually what that is so a rough foundation is a cellular concrete box forming a unified foundation for an entire building structure so a raft behaves something like a boat in water displacing a large amount of soil while also frequently holding back groundwater so um also, some foundations of heavy structures erected on loose sand permitted by water must allow the building to float on such a soil. So, and uh, they are built by means of rafts, which are similar to the um, hull of a ship. So, that is interesting to learn about. If you're more interested in that, I highly recommend you taking the advanced structures class and just um, try to do the calculations and do a little more um, and go a little more in detail. And we are moving to the next structural requirement and that is strength. So this requirement uh, is concerned with the integrity of the structure and of each of its individual parts under any and all expected loads. So uh, no portion of the building will physically fail in use, and we need to take care of that when we design the building. So here is another example of the foundation on piles, how that works, and you can see the friction piles, and you can see load-bearing piles. So there are different variations and how that works in different soils. So please just familiarize yourself with 
uh, those images in um, option. Um, also, um, what else is important to remember here is that the responsibility for strength rests squarely on the shoulders of the structural engineer. So even if the architect designs the beautiful building, the, art, the structural engineers still uh, need to have their impact and they still need to understand whether it's um, actually feasible and if it's buildable. So uh, if the structural load is too much, then the building will have to be redesigned. So um, now it's done with the computers and um, the computer permits a more accurate analysis of problems of exceptional complexity. So for example, when you design for earthquakes, you can do its mathematical modeling before you even um, touch, uh, break the ground. So, uh, but computers still have their limits. And when you analyze the exceptionally difficult problem, that cannot be realistically carried out through mathematical modeling. So you still need to actually um, solve the problem by means of a test on a structural model of the building. So you just need to actually build the reduced scale model and um, you need to know the material properties and appropriate scale ratios for length and thicknesses. So, and also the ratios for static and dynamic loads to actually uh, do that like in real life. So, uh, also, uh, those um, can be done for the uh, pavilions and some temporary sculptures and structures. So it's always good to have that mock-up before uh, that is actually implemented on the site. So we are moving to the next. A structural requirement and that is the functionality and that is concerned with the influence of the adopted structure on the purposes for which the building is erected so actually that answers the question why so um, if um, there is some excessive flexibility of a structure that may impair the functionality of the building uh, even under static loads, and we're not even talking about the dynamic load. So you always need to kind of like test and try to go um, outside the box when you uh, design and con uh, construct the building, but actually before you construct the building. We are moving to the next sub chapter that is economy. So that is still one of the structural requirements. So, um, of course, we need to think about economy. We need to have all those buildings to be cost effective. And um, just because uh, the owner pays for the building and they absorb all the construction costs, um, architects and constructors and engineers, they need to be considered of that. So um, sometimes economy is not a requirement of architecture. For example, some of the star architects, they can design the buildings, they don't really worry about the cost, but some of the, and most actually of the owners, um, they need to understand the financial value of the building and actually if it's feasible to build or um, it can wait till a better opportunity. So uh, the cost of the structural design itself represents usually less than 1% of the total cost of the building. So, and the money allotted to the structural design are subdivided into a budget for the preliminary design. So in which the system is actually established in um, when you do the final design, that includes preparation of the working drawings and specs, and also um, a check of the shop drawings prepared by the fabricator, 
and sometimes inspection or complete supervision during construction. So um, this part is critically important. Structural design and economy and the feasibility is critically important, but actually budget-wise, it doesn't take up that much money. So um, when we talk about availability of equipment and skilled labor that actually sometimes limits methods of construction in a variety of ways so um for example uh the material prices they can skyrocket and that will influence the construction or uh, use of special equipment actually may be dictated uh, by the uh, terrain, by the topography of the site. So that definitely varies from site to site and that uh, and those factors may actually influence the cost. So please uh, remember that. So if the same building was erected in the northern uh, states, it does not mean that it will still be the same cost in like southeast. And also, uh, when you want to reduce the cost, what actually can be done, you can do some prefabricated elements that can be delivered from the same uh, factory or plant and um, also use some other things such as energy considerations. And uh, that is when the building is already enclosed, when the building is finished. So uh, let's talk about aesthetics of the building, so um, it cannot be denied, uh, of course, by imposing the um, uh, architectural vision, uh, sometimes the, it places the limitations on the structural system. So, and sometimes architects do not really want to show the structure, but sometimes it is exposed. So that definitely um, limits and sometimes it actually increases the uh, accessibility. And it, it actually, sometimes the structure is celebrated. For example, like Santiago Calatrava, uh, this structure is an essential element of the design and all his buildings as well. And uh, you can see the uh, Richard Rogers partnership uh, that designed London uh, Heathrow Air uh, Airport. So that structure is celebrated. That's not just part of the structural design. It's actually part of the aesthetical uh, design of the airport. So um, it's debatable. You know, the beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but still structure can be beautiful if properly designed and constructed. So uh, also there are many images here in this little sub chapter. So uh, please take a look at the Frank Gehry buildings here, how that is actually exposed and what is hidden. So please just get familiar with that. And also there are some environmental sculptures, how that is actually uh, represented in the urban fabric. Uh, then you can see the uh, HSBC building, the Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation building. So that is like an extreme example of structural expression in a tall building. So you can see basically how it is connected. You can see all the diagonal bracing and other systems that were um, incorporated here. So, um, and we are moving to the optimal structures. So a discussion of the basic requirements of structure uh, actually brings us naturally to the question of whether one can satisfy all these requirements and obtain the best structure for a given building. So actually there is no way you can do the best structure. So um, it should be most practical or satisfying. So for the owner, it should probably be the least expensive and that will be the best building. For individual laborers, 
it should employ the most human hours. So what can be done fast? So that is the best building. And for example, for the contractor, it should employ the least human hours uh, to secure the greatest profit for sure. And for the supplier of a specific material, the best structure should use that material in large quantities. So, um, and for the structural engineer, it might be the easiest to analyze, for example, and so on. We can go in, uh, on and on uh, and just compare all the trades and see what is actually best for each of them. Um, we will not do that for the sake of time. So, um, Definitely that uh, it's obvious that the question of establishing the best structure does not have a simple or a single answer. Um, so, uh, and there is still a number of specific limitations and restrictions which we'll have to operate under. And also uh, what we need to uh, consider is like the requirements actually, if it satisfies the owner program requirements, if that is actually that the architect would like to envision, or if it's something that the general contractor can, is able and is uh, willing to construct. So, and that actually wraps up our chapter four. So uh, there is a lot of, um, food for thought and please review the chapter, please review the images. They are really good and that will actually help you uh, to metabolize the concepts that we discussed here. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in chapter five.